Professor Pal Alualia. Now, Professor Alualia is has a deep interest in the complexities of identity formation and his own upbringing and professional career reflects a myriad of cultural influences. Uh, he's born in Kenya, schooled in Canada, uh, received a bachelor's degree and master's of arts from the University of Saskatchewan. He then completed his PhD at Flinders University in Adelaide. Uh, from 2014 to 2018, he served as Pro Vice Chancellor of Research and Innovation at the University of Portsmouth before being appointed as Vice Chancellor and President of the University of the South Pacific. So I can't think of anyone better equipped to talk to us about Australia and the Asia and uh, the Asia Pacific education, research, and scientific collaborations. Uh, just before I hand over to Pal, I'd like to remind you all to please get involved in our discussions this afternoon online if you'd like to. That tiny URL uh, link and we'll have have all the details on the screen for you shortly, but for now, I'm going to hand over and please make him feel very welcome, Pal. Thank you very much. I uh, want to begin by acknowledging the uh, traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay respect to the elders past and present. Um, it's a great honor to be um, here this afternoon and be given the opportunity to, to engage with you on the broader theme of a tech-powered, human-driven future and present uh, our vision as a university for higher education in the Pacific and the opportunities for collaboration between Australian and uh, Pacific nations, between Australian and Pacific nations. But I want to begin by thanking the symposium organizers for their kind in invitation. I'm thrilled to join this uh, very stimulating gathering. And my apologies that I can't be with you in person. Uh, I had another engagement in Canberra just an hour ago. Uh, but let me just tell you a little bit about the University of South Pacific first. The university was established in 1968, in fact, prior to most Pacific nations um, uh, receiving independence, and is uniquely structured and positioned to support and nurturing uh, of future Pacific Island generations. With 14 campuses and 10 centers spread over 12 Pacific Island countries, the university has over 25,000 students, nearly 2,000 staff, and is spread over 33,000 square kilometers of the Pacific Ocean. Um, a, a task which I don't think many people would appreciate what, what that vastness and that complexity means as a vice chancellor. As custodians of Pacific culture and identity, there's a profound sense of kinship that resonates in our university, and the Pacific is part of one family, and this relationship is deeply shared with neighboring nations, in particular Australia. In fact, the whole notion of Vuvale is, as one family is very central to this, um, this connection. So the fusion of technologies characterized by the fourth industrial revolution has blurred the lines between the physical, the digital, and the biological spheres. And I probably want to briefly reflect on the Israeli historian, which who many of you would have heard of, Yuval Noah Harari, and his 2018 book, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. And what Harari clearly points out is that we're in the midst of a technological revolution that will fundamentally alter our world. The prevalence of artificial intelligence and the intersection of biotech and infotech, for example, are going to see a completely new order in which technology will dominate our lives, if it isn't already. Furthermore, the dominance of those who control data and manipulate algorithms will impact upon us, whether it's in, in finance to, to other, other places. So for us in the Pacific, where the use of technology remains rather limited, these seem like first world issues that might have little relevance to the day-to-day -day realities of everyday life in the Pacific. However, these are precisely the challenges that keep a vice chancellor awake as we plan for a different world. Our challenge is to respond to this or else the Pacific peoples will simply become cheap labor for those economies closest to them. And it's with this in mind that we're trying to adjust our changing and unsettling world. And we're taking some measures to help our students navigate this complexity. A new model of um, uh, learning 
Education 4.0 was proposed by the World Economic Forum in 2019, which envisioned us to prepare the next generation with the necessary skills to survive the ongoing fourth industrial revolution. And of course, many people are already talking perhaps of a fifth industrial revolution. And in 2020, Education 4.0 morphed into a framework that rethinks education at all stages of a person's schooling and embraces technology-enhanced learning experiences that can create graduates who are more empowered and equipped with both digital and social emotional skills. As a university, we've had to traverse this terrain for a very long time, given our uh, vast um, the distances from where we operate. And of course, uh, the digital revolution has really aided us in that endeavor. From a, a regional con uh, context, and if we can move to slide two, please, specific regional education framework uh, is, is really about moving towards a Education 2030. In short, it's called PACREF. And this is a collective approach of 15 Pacific Island nations to prioritize action on quality and relevance, free learning pathways, really focusing on the teaching profession that will maximize sustainable gains in student learning outcomes and well-being. Now, if we very quickly look at that slide, in July of this year, the Pacific Island Forum leaders at its 51st meeting adopted the Pacific Islands 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific Continent to focus on those themes. And I won't read them out, but you can see them on the, on the, on the screen. And in terms of, of a university, the, in terms of education, it's really to prioritize academic programs to teach skills required by Education 4.0 in order to successfully address the challenges by having a suitably qualified workforce. And in terms of research, of course, we're really trying to align priority areas to the United Nations Development Goals, which can address the challenges that are listed here, but also the challenges that are, are so pertinent to our member countries. If we can then uh, move to slide three, please. <sighs> what you can see here is, is really in a nutshell, the, the, um, the way in which we've connected um, education from uh, the experience from a, from a global perspective, all the way to our graduate attributes and really thinking about education at USP in terms of a learning and teaching excellence framework. The university's vision is quite simple. It's to shape Pacific futures and is driven by our strategic plan, which was developed to address the continuity of, of learning and teaching, particularly in a post COVID-19 uh, environment and the reskilling revolution uh, sparked by the fourth industrial revolution, where the aim is to create a student-centered and quality-focused higher education culture. And of course, germane to all of this is technology. At USP, we, uh, it, the university plays a critical role where it can engage through its teaching and learning, through its research, consultancy, capacity building and engagement with Pacific governments through regional cooperation and ICT-related activities, including digitalization. USP is also part of what's called the crop mechanism. It's not just a university, it's seen as, a, as an agency which is mandated to cut across uh, several areas. And crop is the, um, the council, the, the regional council for um, uh, organizations in the Pacific. And, um, and here we actually play a huge role in the entire human resource development needs of the, of the, the 12 countries that I represent at the university, but also um, to ensure that our ICT needs are met uh, throughout the region. To that extent, we have our own networks. We have something called USP Net, uh, and we uh, use that to, um, to connect the region. So for example, uh, when the Tonga um, volcano erupted, we were the only uh, single place left with, with any kind of communication, albeit that it was in one of our, our, our centers outside of uh, Tonga Tapu. Um, so really we're driven by this uh, research ec teaching excellence framework uh, and PACREF to best prepare our students to be skilled global citizens in an intensely tech-powered society. If we can move to the 
to the next slide, please. Our strategic plan, again, uh, integrates trans transdisciplinary research themes to address the needs of our member countries, to explore the intractable challenges, including natural hazards facing the Pacific, and we're just entering the cyclone season, and um, also contribute internationally to knowledge production and knowledge transfer. Uh, they are, these are all aligned, of course, with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and the Small Island Developing States Accel Accelerated Modalities of Action, the Samoa Pathway, which was launched in 2014. We're focused to contribute to the continuing development empowerment of the Pacific and its people. So translating research into sustainable outcomes that make a difference, whether by way of new inventions, products, or creative ways of seeing solutions to problems is at the core of what the university contributes to the continuing development and empowerment of the Pacific region and its people. I must uh, stress at this point that, of course, this is not something that we can do alone. This is why this is, there's no better time for the region to cooperate. And why, would, why should Australia cooperate? Because this is Australia's backyard. Much influence over the last 50 years has come from Australia. And of course, many, many hundreds of thousands of Pacific Islanders not only live here, and this is in a very broad sense, uh, a mitigation to the sorts of security threats that we we're facing in the world today. Uh, if we then move to the, to the, to the last slide, I'll just make a, a few comments. I think the, U, the university is committed to the Pacific Islands foreign leaders vision, the first slide that I, I went through, uh, the 2050 strategy for the blue ocean economy, and the and are the USP with its strong technical expertise uh, can really engage more in supporting the Blue Pacific strategy in enhancing livelihoods, food, and nutritional security to the region. But for us, because we are so, so small and so affected, climate change and the oceans are in, inextricably linked. So if the ocean was not there to absorb, um, you know, the, uh, the, the carbon, uh, di the, the CO2 emissions, et cetera, we would be in a, in a, in a far more difficult situation. So our university is at the forefront of trying to work through that nexus. Now, in recent years, there's been a huge increase in labor mobility and population migration to Pacific Rim metropolitan countries. And whilst this has been a great advantage for some people, it's also led to skilled labor shortages, especially in the health sector and in many economic sectors in the Pacific Island countries. We're now finding that there's a critical shortage of, uh, which is impeding economic growth and development. So for us, educating our own really is important to help solve the shortage of the skilled workers that are so desperately needed uh, in the Pacific. A clear uh, issue where I think, um, you know, we really have to partner uh, and, and really get some more technological solutions is public health. The rapid changing lifestyles and high incidences of non-communicable diseases and high mortality are putting much of an economic burden and developmental challenges to our Pacific Island countries. Our strategic plan has proposed to move into the health area, which is something we haven't done in the past. And from 2024, um, we will open a whole new campus focused on health uh, and in the Solomon Islands. But equally, the environment and agriculture are critical areas. And in some ways, we're still operating in a very 20th century mode uh, in a world that requires 21st century solutions. So there are, as I said earlier, frequent occurrences of geological and climate-induced natural disasters. There was an earthquake two days ago in Samoa, uh, in volcanic eruptions. Everybody knows about uh, Tonga, tsunamis, flooding, and tropical cyclones uh, as a result of climate change are posing more developmental challenges and with greater frequency. So our Pacific Center for Environment and Sustainable Development is engaged in uh, natural disaster management 
And we are very much focused on um, risk reduction for resilience, disaster response, and recovery. But climate change variability and sea level rise are threats to Pacific people's livelihoods, foods, and nutritional and environmental security, and sustainable security in the Pacific region. The USP, as I've said, has the technical expertise and experience required to assist uh, the Pacific Island countries in understanding that climate change and its implications and its engaged in capacity build, building of graduates in climate change in examining those strategies uh, required for resilient building. Let's not forget that, uh, you know, probably during the lifetime of most of us, if things don't change, one of our island countries, Tuvalu, will probably be the first um, to, to be underwater. Uh, they are leading a very precarious life at the moment. Our agriculture discipline is based at the Samoa campus and is engaged in research on improved agricultural production techniques, looking particularly at how you provide food security in a time when climate change is so prevalent. But we do have challenges in that we seem to be working in silos where our engineers, aren't really talking to our, the people in the agricultural discipline. So they're not finding solutions that are required urgently to the wicked problems that we're so all, all aware of. And this is where I think uh, partnerships with, with your academy uh, can really pave the way for a better future. The last bit that I might uh, bring up just also is, um, and this is not very different from other places, but you can see how um, energy is just a critical uh, issue for the Pacific at the moment. Uh, as we see the price of, of energy go up and renewable energy, you would have thought would be such a natural solution. But just to give you an example, we're building a new campus in the Solomon Islands. We've already committed to a um, solar powered plant, but it might just sit there as a, a white elephant because the Solomon Islands Power Company has decided that uh, they want a lot of money just to connect us to the grid and to keep to continue to pay uh, on a monthly basis as if uh, we weren't producing any electricity for the grid. So thank you very much. I'd like to stop there by just saying that, you know, uh, really welcome the opportunity for us to work collaboratively and uh, really to ensure that the Pacific isn't left behind. And as I've said, a strong par partnership now paves the way for a better future for everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, can I invite everybody once again to uh, get into the questions? I think we can have a really good discussion here um, about, about these partnerships. And in fact, is anyone in the room uh, wanting to put a question to Pal? If not yet, I will. Oh, well, there's one at the back, please. Thank you. Um, I was a student at the University of the South Pacific 40 years ago. Um, Congratulations. And then I took a lectureship there and then migrated to Australia. Now, one of the things while I was staff at USP that I really noticed and I was heavily involved in was um, discussions and investment and duty of care to the indigenous populations. So as part of a group where we reported back to each of the nations involved in, the, in USP about how the students were doing, what was being done to support them, and then consulting on what, could, what else could be done to support them. So I think there's a lot to be learned from USP in terms of how do we support indigenous populations in an effective way. But that's also taking into account that the indigenous populations amongst the, 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 the Pacific nations are much larger fractions of the entire population. So I'm not saying things can transfer over, the challenges are different, but surely we can learn from one another. Uh, th thank, thank you very much for those, those comments. Of course, um, you know, I, I would have to begin by saying that uh, it's pioneers like yourself 
who have really made a difference to the university and, and have instilled those values which I think are very deep uh, set within our 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 um, DNA now, and and the, all the things that you've talked about are are absolutely key aspects of our strategy as we uh, try and prepare our students for for the for for the workforce. I think I might have. Have I lost you there? No, no. We are absolutely here and paying attention. Did anyone else have a question? Oh, here we go. Hello, um, my name's Susan Beats, and I'm a uh, Nimba Wawam woman um, from remote, um, very remote northwest New South Wales. I was really interested and appreciated hearing um, one particular line, especially in your slides, that said the South, the South Pacific desperately needs your help to drive changes that don't simply render our people powerless. I want to thank you for that. Um, we too are looking for collaborations um, because for our communities in um, remote Australia, in fact all over Australia, um, people tend to come to us and data mine and extract our knowledges which continue to perpetuate rendering us powerless. Um, so perhaps we can learn from you. Um, so I I'd like to um, make contact. Thank you. Oh, look, I, I would welcome that, and, and I think people have my contact details there. But I, I think what I'd like to say is, what you know, working with an academy, I'm a member of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia, so I'm, I'm well aware that there's a lot of expertise in the academy, and, and that's what I'm reaching out to, to say, uh, you know, you have so much expertise, and, and many of our fellows are, are emeritus. Uh, I think there's a real opportunity um, for for us as a on an academy to university basis with the assistance of the Australian government to um, to invite your, your fellows to come and contribute for short periods of time uh, in in the Pacific and and that's really what I have in mind that that I think that that would be a game changer for us uh, to to really have that um, that human capacity that, that we're so short on to uh, to to help us. Um, you know, uh, forge the future of, of our people in the Pacific. What, what do you think is the greatest opportunity that we have to, to form those partnerships? So I, as I've just said, uh, you know, one of, one of the best ways is to, to forge a, a, a direct relationship between the academy. So it's academy to academy? Well, it's academy to, to university. university. Anyway. Yeah, rather. Uh, and, uh, and we, you know, there's so much expertise, and, and some people, you know, it, it's not academics, as you know, don't just stop working the day they retire. I mean, we, you know, people just keep going. So there's a great opportunity for us to, to tap into that resource and to, uh, to, and they've got phenomenal experience. And I have great respect for, you know, uh, our, our scholars in, in, the, uh, in, in, in the four academies. Is there any, anyone else in the room who had a question? Oh. And online people are being very quiet. Uh, we are actually a little bit over time. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, Professor. Um, and, and, you know, I think we all can agree that uh, our Pacific family are very much family and should be treated like that. Thank you. Please.